Oral questions by members? Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Beginning tomorrow, of course, we know that commuters could well wake up to a complete shutdown of the bus and sea bus service in Vancouver. More than a million rides will not happen. Half a million commuters will have no option. We now have learned that 60% of those who bus to work or to school don't have a driver's license or a car and have no option. They will be completely stranded. So it's time for this government to act on behalf of British Columbians, do something real, in fact, do something at all. So the question goes to the government, presumably to the Labour Minister, perhaps the Transportation Minister, because perhaps they don't agree that do nothing is a policy. So can we hear from anyone on the government ranks who has an idea of what they're actually going to do tomorrow rather than sit in their offices and watch television? Minister of Labour. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm more optimistic than that party over there uh, ever is going to be when it comes to collective bargaining. Mr. Speaker, it is always incredibly stressful for those who see that there might be a threat of uh, transit shutdown, and no one wants to see disruption in our public transportation. The union and the company understand their responsibility to those who they serve, their customers, the transit riders. That's why, Mr. Speaker, they are on the table today negotiating, because that's where the, 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 the contract will be negotiated, not in this House. <clears throat> Leader of the official opposition on a supplemental. Well, it's clear the Labour Minister intends to do absolutely nothing, whether it's in this House, in his office, in the streets of Metro Vancouver, He's going to do nothing while half a million people go out into the coldest days so far this year and try to get to work, try to get their kids to childcare. And when those nurses don't show up in the critical care units around Vancouver, it's going to be the Labour Minister who's sitting in his office doing nothing. So perhaps someone, anyone in the government ranks can come to their senses and say that they have a plan for how to deal with the Metro Vancouver transit strike, which will cripple our city. Minister of Labour. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, respecting free collective bargaining, respecting workers' rights to free collective bargaining to this leader of the opposition means do nothing. That is incredibly sad, Mr. Speaker. This Members. Mr. Speaker, this, this particular union, Unifor, and the Coast Mountain Bus Company, they have successfully bargained for decades without any help from outside, without any interruption, Mr. Speaker. They are at the table right now. They are at the table right now, and they are going to negotiate a collective agreement. I'm hopeful that they will conclude their negotiations today so that there is no disruption in this uh, lower mainland, Mr. Speaker. Member North Vancouver Seymour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. More than 11,000 people use the sea bus, and people on the North Shore have been feeling the impact of this strike for now four weeks. Now it's going to get a whole lot worse for the entire Lower Mainland. BC Ferries is warning foot passengers they could be stranded at the Tuathan Terminal because the strike will cut off all public transit. So my question to the Minister, what is his advice to commuters who will be left stranded at the Tuasin Ferry tomorrow. Minister of Labour. Uh, Mr. Speaker, both parties are at the, collect at the table right now and they are bargaining. And I have full faith in both of, both of those parties that they will be successfully concluding their negotiations today so that there is no disruption. Because I know both of those parties that are at the, at the table right now they understand their responsibility to their customers, the transit riders, and everyone else who use transit, Mr. Speaker. They are working hard right now, 
And unlike that side, I have full faith in those two parties to conclude collective agreements because collective agreements work in this province. It has worked for decades. And, and, and Mr. Speaker, I know they always, when they see labor dispute, they, say, they see political opportunity. Mr. Speaker, that is a sad state of affair. They've done nothing in the last two and a half years. We're not going to take any lessons from that side. Member North Vancouver Seymour on a supplemental. 76,000 UBC and SFU students regularly use the bus to get to class. UBC students have created a Facebook event to camp on the University Mall. SFU students are using Facebook to organize a hike up Burnaby Mountain to get to class. Students are stressed. They're stressed because of exams, and now they're equally stressed because they don't know if they're going to get to school tomorrow because of the transit strike. What message does the minister have to the thousands of students who won't be able to get to class tomorrow morning? Enjoy the hike. Call an Uber. Minister of Labour. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's interesting and amazing, actually, the member opposite is talking about students. Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, wasn't that party when they were in government, they raised their tuition fee three times? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are. Members. Mr. Speaker, it is, it is really sad that the opposition, opposition are trying to secure a cheap political points here at the expense of the labor dispute, Mr. Speaker. But I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, despite their theatrics, they know the dispute will be resolved at the bargaining table, and the parties are at the bargaining table. It will be resolved, and I'm fully hopeful. Member Saanich North in the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over a year ago, I asked the Minister of Health for realistic timelines about when community members in my riding will start to seeing real solutions to the shortage of primary uh, health care services on Saanich North and the Islands. His response, he mentioned that one in six British Columbians was without a family doctor. He also promised that a primary care network would be established in several areas in the province, including the Saanich Peninsula, within the year. In April of this year, I asked again uh, the Minister of Health about the health care crisis in my riding and many other areas in the province. His response was that government was hiring hundreds of family practice doctors, nurse practitioners and clinical pharmacists to ease the crisis. At the time, the minister was quite optimistic about getting new primary care networks established around the province and, in particular, specific areas of the province experiencing acute shortages. In my writing to date, the most substantial work has been done, relieving pressure has been done by nonprofit organizations. My question is to the Minister of Health. On the ground, my constituents are not seeing results. They're having difficulty accessing primary care services. What is the delay in changing the outcomes for people in the Sandwich Peninsula and across Greater Victoria? Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, Honourable Speaker, I was very proud just to be joined by the Minister of Finance in announcing a new urgent and primary care centre in James Bay, which will have a real effect. <laughs> It's one of uh, 11 in operation, 14 that we have announced that are making a real difference, particularly in communities around British Columbia. I want to note particularly the extraordinary work by doctors and nurse practitioners and nurses in Prince George who developed their primary care network working hand in hand with an urgent primary care centre that's making a real difference for people. Here in the South Island, we're also taking steps. The, the, member, uh, the member will know that on November uh, the 22nd, which is uh, just recently, the final proposal around the South Island Division of Family Practice proposal was submitted. We're taking specific steps and specific action. We're working with doctors and nurse practitioners and the community, not imposing, but working with them, and that will lead to lasting solutions. I'm very proud of the work of the South Island Division of Family Practice, very proud of the work of the Ministry of Health. We're making progress, and we hope to have announcements soon. Saanich North and the Islands on a supplemental. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the minister for his response uh, earlier this summer. And the situation was dire. Early this summer, the Times colonist, uh, doctors were saying that primary care in the, in the Greater Victoria area was in the verge of collapse. I've met with a wide variety of health care practitioners in my riding to discuss the situation that's going on in their offices. Health professionals are exhausted, exasperated, and feeling underappreciated, Mr. Speaker. The system is overburdened, and practitioners are burning out. Mr. Speaker, since those questions last year, I've had a constant flow of communications from my constituents who are equally exhausted, exasperated, and feeling as ignored as those in the health care system that we rely on. Patient attachment to primary health care home, a primary health care home is important. However, it is just a single metric. It's equally important that we not forget some of these most deeply intimate relationships with our health care professionals. We must focus on the quality of life of both patient and practitioner. Again, to the Minister of Health, how is the vision of his transformation of our primary health care system addressing not only patient attachment to practitioners, but also ensuring that they have a quality of life and a health care system that's meeting the needs in our community? Minister of Health. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And, and yes, I, I think in particular, uh, young doctors have a different view of uh, the way the, uh, their practices should go. Overwhelmingly, for example, in surveys we take of, uh, of young doctors, there's a desire to move to alternate payment models and fee-for-service. But, uh, Honourable Speaker, both are essential parts of our system. In the last year, for example, 338 new fee-for-service general practitioner doctors have been added in British Columbia over the past year. 129 alternate payment plan doctors have been added. Now, significant numbers, of course, are retiring as well, but that is 140 new, net new doctors in 2018-19. That doesn't mean that we're able to deal with all of the challenges out there, but what we're doing, adding urgent and primary care centers and in this area of the province in particular, the most successful urgent primary care center in Langford. We're adding primary care networks. I cite the ones in George, the ones in Penticton that are working and making extraordinary transformational change at a local level. The support for community health centers such as Island Sexual Health and many in the members' ridings, which have helped sustain and support and advance community health centers. This is a comprehensive plan and we're doing it methodically, step by step, community by community, working with local divisions of family practice. So we're, at, we're dealing with the problems and the problems faced both by patients and doctors in the system. I think it's an effective response. We're doing it, as I say, in partnership with the divisions of family practice and it's why. I don't think there has ever been, overall, as good a relationship between the provincial government and doctors. I remind the member that 98.5% of doctors approved our latest negotiated agreement in British Columbia, which is an extraordinary success. Member Kamloops, South Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today uh, in the gallery, we have uh, representatives from the Marpole and uh, Kitsilano West Forth Business Improvement uh, Associations. They're here uh, in support of our split assessment uh, legislation, uh, which would provide relief to small businesses that are facing skyrocketing property taxes, uh, literally on the airspace, the undeveloped airspace over their heads. Uh, now, I also have with me here uh, today uh, a July 3rd, 2019 briefing note uh, for the Premier, uh, which uh, says, uh, uh, and I quote, uh, the, uh, uh, th there will be a particularly strong impact on those operating under triple net leases and a loss of jobs, end quote, in relation to the skyrocketing property taxes. So my question uh, to the Minister of Municipal Affairs uh, would be this. Um, can the minister please explain uh, to the small business representatives who are here in the gallery today why she has taken no action whatsoever to address the skyrocketing, skyrocketing property taxes, which are making it very, very difficult for these businesses to, to continue to operate, and in fact, has resulted in lots of businesses having to close their doors. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing and Citizen Services. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. This is a critical issue for small business. It's also a critical issue for nonprofits and the arts and cultural organizations, uh, Honourable Speaker. Now, I think it's important to, um, to reflect on how we got here, because we got here because of out-of-control skyrocketing real estate prices. 
and that has had significant impact. Absolutely. We got here, Honourable Speaker, because the opposition ignored the problem for a decade. They received, they received correspondence from, I believe it was the CFIB, about a decade ago saying, will you help us with this? And they ignored it. Well, Honourable Speaker, we have not ignored it. We engage with stakeholders, including Vancouver and Metro Vancouver, to look at short-term and long-term strategies to improve affordability. And that's why, Honourable Speaker, we are working on an interim solution for the 2020 tax year while we develop a permanent fix to this situation. Member Kamloops, South Thompson, on a supplemental. Well, uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the minister talks about interim solutions. Uh, she's, she's been aware of this, uh, this issue for two and a half uh, years, going on three years, and, and she's done absolutely nothing. She talks about uh, solutions for the future. Where, where is action to address these, the, the, the challenges these small businesses are facing? And, and just, and just last, yesterday, we learned that the City of Vancouver is now proposing a further 8.2% property tax hike for the forthcoming year. Uh, the, the property taxes are going to go up, uh, Mr. Speaker. Now, in, in, in the gallery, uh, in, in the gallery uh, with us today is, uh, is Gordon uh, Bowman. Uh, he's the owner, owner of Marpole uh, Physiotherapy Clinic. Uh, Gordon's uh, small business employs over a dozen people, and his property taxes have increased by 63% over the last four years. Now, he's worried, about, uh, he's worried about the coming tax year, and he says, and I quote, I cannot sustain being taxed on the air and not what's actually uh, there, end quote. There are many tragic, similar stories of small businesses facing the same dire situation. So my question again to the minister would be this. When will the minister throw small businesses a lifeline and fix this unfair tax, which is hanging over the heads of small businesses across the Lower Mainland? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing and Citizen Services. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. We are doing just that, Honourable Speaker. We are uh, making sure that for the 2020 tax year that there is some relief coming. We're also making sure that we have a permanent fix that takes uh, into consideration all components of this tax. But, Honourable Speaker, the members opposite seem to think that they have, uh, have, have absolutely uh, no responsibility in this. And I just want to point out that in July 2019, we heard from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, Samantha Howard, who says, and I quote, Despite pressure from organizations like CFIB for well over a decade, the provincial government has, made, uh, has not made any serious effort to address the issue. So, Honourable Speaker, their inaction has led to the struggles that small business are currently facing, and we're fixing it. Member Caribou North. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We're proud of the fact that we've seen a 7.3% increase in small business under this government, and we're seeing a decline in small business under this government. So, Mr. Speaker, Dr. Pisani immigrated to Vancouver when he was three months old, and he is now the proud owner and operator of the Granville Dental Wellness Centre, which employs 11 people. He is here today. And he says, and I quote, in three years, my taxes have increased 60%. This is unsustainable for our small business and cannot continue, end quote. Can the minister tell Dr. Pisanu what is the intern solution and how is she going to fix it for the 2020 tax year? Minister, Municipal Affairs and Housing and Citizen Services. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. And I want to say to all the business owners here, we have been listening, we've been hearing, and in fact, last year, last year we invited uh, uh, business improvement associations, we invited um, other, uh, others to our working group so that we could make sure that we understood the exact nature of the issue because the people on the other side didn't even do that, Honourable Speaker. They didn't even gather people together to hear what was going on. Even though they said that they were struggling, Honourable Members. Speaker, we are taking action, Honourable Speaker. We are, will be ready for the 2020 tax year. 
Member Caribou North on a supplement. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So a broad coalition of stakeholders is calling on this government to address this issue before neighbourhoods are changed forever. Also in the gallery today is Ragnar Bertelsen of Ragnar Jewelers and Donna Hole, a fantastic owner of Coco's Closet, a small boutique for women's clothing. These are real people. Minister facing unsustainable tax increases under this government. Will the minister commit to them today that she will fix this for the 2020 tax year? Minister Municipal Affairs and Housing and Citizen Speaker. Services. They are absolutely real people, and they're real people that the previous government ignored. We are not ignoring them, Honourable Speaker. We've heard them loud and clear, and there will be a tax fix for the 2020 tax year. Member Chilliwack Kent. Speaker. Well, last week, last week, the Minister of State for Child Care sent out some details to a reporter on the so called creation of child care spaces. But it's clear that they're fake spaces because most are not actually working. Let me explain, Mr. Speaker. Out of 4,700 spaces announced as long as a year and a half ago, fewer than 1,700 are operational today. Out of nearly 6,000 spaces announced in this fiscal year, only 374 are actually working. That's about as close to zero as you can get. Why is the Premier and his minister misleading parents by announcing fake spaces instead of real ones that actually deliver care to children? Mini members. Minister of State for Child Care. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. For many, many years, we all know that parents in this province have been struggling with the child care chaos, and many of the child care operators are also finding it really hard to maintain their business with a lack of support from the previous government for 16 long years. And I don't know where the member opposite got his numbers from. Number Members, well, members, apparently they members, don't want to hear an answer. Uh, members, please allow the minister to answer the question. Minister. And let me put it this way. Ever since we became government, we've been working hard with the sector, with childcare providers, with parents, with early childhood educators, to make sure we put together a comprehensive plan to lower childcare costs for the first time in BC's history and accelerate the creation of childcare spaces. And this is the fact that under the previous government, in about four years, they funded about 4,000 spaces, and we've achieved 10,000 spaces in a year, only a little over a year. Member Chilliwack Kent on a supplemental. Mr. Speaker, you, you, Mr. Speaker, you can always tell when the NDP are doing a lousy job because they go on the attack. It's predictable. It's like clockwork. But these are the minister's own numbers. This government promised 24,000 new spaces over three years. Members, now, after members, two years, members, the member for Chilliwack Kent has the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government promised 24,000 new spaces over three years. Now, after two years of trying, only 2,055 spaces are actually operating. That's 9% of their promise after spending, by the way, $600 million. So will the minister today make the following more forthright announcement? My program has collapsed. I've been announcing fake spaces, not making spaces. I'm 90% short in my promise to parents, and I'm sorry to them. Will the minister announce that today? Members, 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 
we're eating into the opportunity. We're eating into the opportunity for the opposition to ask more questions. Minister of State for Child Care. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. While well, it is very encouraging to hear the member opposite talking about child care, they have let the child care crisis grow for 16 long years and have not done many much for it. And I am very sure the member opposite knows very well that the number that they're throwing is incorrect. Our government has funded. Our government has funded over 10,000 spaces in a short little over a year, while they've done funded 4,000 in four years. Honourable Speaker, families in BC are struggling with the shortage of childcare spaces. Early childhood educators are struggling with lack of the support. And what do the member opposite, the critic, what the critic for childcare says? He, when he talked about early childhood educators, he said we might as well invest in software and machines. Well, we're investing in people in this province. We have put together, we have put together a comprehensive plan to lower Members. child care fees for the first time in BC's history. Living wages going down because child care fee is going down. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Members, <laughs> members, member for Prince George Vilmont. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. Well, having failed to take any initiative on his own to resolve the dispute at UNBC, which has the potential to uh, see students lose a semester of their education. Today, we have the Faculty Association at UNBC asking the minister to appoint a special mediator. Here's what the Faculty Association had to say. So, and I quote, without an agreement this week, there is almost no chance of saving the semester without disrupting next semester. So this minister has sat on his hands. He has ignored the situation at UNBC. Students, the community, faculty are upset. They are worried. And they have a very specific ask of this minister. So today, will he stand in the House, do the right thing, and appoint a special mediator as the Faculty Association at UNBC has asked him to do? Minister of Labour. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker. And uh, it is a, a situation that we were monitoring very, very closely. Mediator was involved in that dispute, Mr. Speaker, and the mediator booked out, and they were still negotiating. They were bargaining as later last night, Mr. Speaker. Now, uh, we, uh, we all understand the, the dire need to have that, that, uh, that dispute resolved. Uh, mediator works best, and, and the member opposite will know, Mediators work best when both parties are willing and ready to participate. They have, I have not seen the request. When I see the request. Members. When I, when I leave this, off, when I leave this house, uh, if that request is there, and we will seriously consider it. Prince George Vilmont on a supplemental. Well, last week, apparently, the member wasn't even sure there was a strike at UNBC. The, today, today, despite him saying he has closely monitored the situation, it's been in the media for hours, Minister. Obviously, you should know that they have made a request for a special mediator. It is his opportunity to stand in this House today and respond directly, make a commitment, get it on the public record. He's done nothing to this point. Here's what the Faculty Association had to say, and again I quote, we are heartbroken for our students whose lives are being upended, end quote. With the help of a mediator, it said bargaining can be completed with the one, one day of fulsome negotiations, and I quote, but without mediation, this strike could stretch on for weeks. 
Minister, it is time to stand in this House, respect the wishes of the Faculty Association, and protect students' education at the University of Northern British Columbia. Will he commit to appointing a special mediator now, Mr. Speaker? Minister of Labour. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I must say, Mr. Speaker, you know, the opposition member turned a blind eye when the campuses are being closed and the students suffered, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, members, it was that, it was that party in government that slashed UNBC's budget by $1.3 million. That's the mess that we inherited. That's the mess that the both parties are trying to deal with at this dispute, Mr. Speaker. We are going to work with those parties. We are going to uh, uh, take Members. their request seriously. And, Mr. Speaker, we'll make that decision in due course. The bell ends question period. Members, I have